Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 4, 2024, are from Exodus chapter 16, 2 through 4, and 9 through 15. Our alternate first reading is 2 Samuel eleven twenty six through 12, 13 A. The psalm is Psalm 78, 23 through 29. We continue our reading through Ephesians, this time chapter 4, 1 through 16. And we also continue our reading through the Bread of Life Discourse, this time John 6, 24 through 35. Is there something we can say about this, Caroline? <laughs> So, yes, we're in our next section of the Bread of Life Discourse. And I, uh, I, a couple of things here. One, I, when you look ahead, next week is verse 35, and then we skip to verse 41 to 51. And what you start seeing in the way in which the Percopies are laid out is what you were talking about last week, Matt, in terms of how the the discourse kind of cycles back on itself. <laughs> and so it's it's all it's it's really difficult to break it up because there's just this, you know, there you you want to be reminded of where you've been. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was doing a workshop on on the Bread of Life discourse a, a, a few weeks ago, or actually a couple months ago now, in thinking about this going through the summer, and I did suggest that the pericope end here at verse thirty four, because what you get at verse thirty five is really a whole new direction, mm -hmm. uh, or a, another layer of what Jesus is, um, is saying, I am the bread of life. And so you don't have to do that, but, but what, but what I'm suggesting is when Jesus says, I am the bread of life in verse 35, it be, it becomes then another, another invitation into what does this mean? Uh, and, uh, and, and we get some other connections here that in, this portion of the of the bread of life discourse that would be sufficient to uh, preach. So, just an observation about uh, about structure. But the way then the pericope, if you end at thirty four, uh, the way it ends, I find then to be uh, in some ways very homiletically homiletically intriguing uh, because you it how it ends is then how uh <clears throat> how it uh, the a uh, continued pattern in the gospel of john of misunderstanding mm -hmm. and so it what you what you have with the woman at the well when jesus mm -hmm. says you know i have i have this living water and she says oh all you know mm -hmm. sir uh, i'll give me this water so i basically i don't have to keep you know Slapping my bucket here twice a day, uh, geez, uh, Nicodemus's misunderstanding mm -hmm. in chapter two, uh, the uh, the conversation between Jesus and the religious leaders about the about the temple, destroy this temple, and in three days mm -hmm. I will raise it up. And so, you, this is what we're getting here in verse thirty four, sir give us this bread always, particularly as Jesus starts connecting it here, which is why we have the passage from Exodus, to the bread from heaven uh, and, the, and the provision of the bread from heaven of God in the wilderness. And so then they're like, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and give life to this world, all in third person, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is not yet talking about himself. <laughs> uh, and but talking about God. And then in verse 35, you will say, I am the bread of life. Uh, but here, sir, sir, give us this bread always. And I think it's a interesting request, not simply because it connects to the misunderstandings in the gospel of John, which are, I don't, which I think, um, well, that's a whole nother podcast anyway. Uh, because what does it, what are we asking for? 
mm-hmm. when we say, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus, give us this bread always. What are we, what are we asking for? What do we mm-hmm. want? Mm-hmm. What are we imagining that that is going to be? And we're only at the cusp of what it's going to be at this point. <laughs> but it, I think it offers uh, a, a, a rhetorical moment on the part of the preacher to say, what are our expectations um, when we say, give us this day our daily bread? One could connect it to the Lord's, or Lord's Prayer, even though the Lord's Prayer is not John, but nonetheless, <laughs> sir, give it's us familiar. this bread. Yeah. So that's, those are some initial thoughts. I have a few more, but well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of struck by the fact that the, the crowd is the first one to bring up the manna. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that, and this comes after Jesus has essentially, maybe accused is the wrong word, but kind of identified their desire to follow him around as kind of a desire for more food, like a kind of a regularity of food. And they're like, well, you know, God provided the manna on a regular basis. You know, that there's this, mm-hmm. that their sense of what's needed is the sustenance but now on a predictable reliable kind of confident basis Mm -hmm. and jesus is still trying to displace that or reorient that to something different Mm -hmm. so i just kind of like that it it, it, in terms of how we might map this on to i think i mentioned last week food food insecurity banqueting i mean stuff like that and the way in which it's not enough just to have access to food. It's not just enough to feed somebody, then to figure out this kind of consistency and this security in it. But then as well, I, that's it's also going to be um, exploded, right? Or Jesus is going to say that's also still not enough. That's not yet the full picture. As important as it is that all the world be fed, mm-hmm. there's more that's still yet needed. And I don't know, that's kind of where I would drop in at least, right? And say, these are all really good concerns that people have, but Jesus is still trying to kind of push them to a higher perspective on what's really at stake here, but also what's really possible with him, that they're still asking for too little right. given who their conversation partner is. Yeah. And that's where that's where the, the language around in verse 29 is so important that uh, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. And you get this language throughout the gospel. Here it is. This is the one work (laughs) is believe in him whom God has sent. And that is, and so to believe in Jesus is to then enter into that, that relationship that, that provides all of that fullness, Matt. And so that's what this is all leading to. It's uh you're asking again. You're you're seeing too little. You're asking for too little because what what this is all leading to is this uh, is this invitation to abide in Jesus or be in the relationship with Jesus that is abundant. You can't even begin to imagine the the fullness and the abundance of what this means. And yet, we're, and yet, where is it where we land on certain? Uh, certain expectations or really sort of penultimate expectations mm-hmm. um, or really truncated expectations of what God is able to do and and what Jesus is able to provide, which is why I find that that request in 34 so intriguing. Sir, give us this bread always. Do they really know what they're asking? Uh, and what does Jesus need them to see? Because the bread that he's offering, of course, is his, his the fullness of himself. I find this hard to preach without acting or without sending an implication that I'm diminishing the feeding and the importance of feeding. But that's, Mm. I think that's one of the tensions here. I appreciate your saying that, Matt. Um, And I want to pick up the baton from what you said. uh, I I can't remember if it was a week ago or two weeks ago. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago when we be, when we moved in. Whenever it is that we moved into John, um, and uh, I guess oh, it was this last, last week. week. <laughs> that was last week. Yeah. Um, that you said, um, um, uh, Caroline and I were talking about looking toward the end, and you said, "But don't give away, you know, the end." Um, 
I want to pick up on that and repeat it in the sense of what Caroline and I are talking about and what Matt is cautioning us uh, in is knowing where we're going, but not getting there so that the um, the tension in the story, uh, to use your words, Caroline, doesn't leave us at the penultimate uh, offering, but actually has us saying, uh, unlike those in the scenes that you're, you're referring to, Caroline, where we're saying, oh, give us this water. Oh, give us this food. Oh, what are you talking about being born again? Oh, what do you mean you're going to destroy this temple? But actually saying, oh, I don't think I get it. And I'm leaning in because I want to. And so if we, in crafting our messages, know where we're going and leave enough of that, um, but you got to hear the rest of the story. You, you don't have it yet. Um, uh, it, it, we, we, we want to know where we're going so that we can leave our listeners. Uh, th- just like, you know, I love Law and Order. And when you're reading, when you're watching Law and Order, uh, they don't spend a lot of time behind the scenes in the life of the characters, uh, of the main characters. Like some of the other shows that are series, there's two stories side by side. Um, with Law and Order, what you get is you get this story ends at the end of, you know, 45 minutes plus commercials, but the law firm's practice continues. And that's why we come back. The police officer's work continues. And that's why we come back. What I'm talking about now is crafting our messages so that we know where we're going, where people realize I got this, but there's something ultimate that I haven't got and I want to lean into it. Well, and that, that I'll just say one more thing that kind of uh that kind of builds on that a little bit, Joy, and then we should go to the other <laughs> the other passages. But uh but that is that one of the reasons to hold off on verse 35, because you will get it again next week, is uh is where Jesus moves from a third person um, you know, what, what, what does this bread mean? You know, wondering what that bread means. Jesus moves to that third person claim to, I am the bread of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, then now that's going to take the, that's going to, going to take the discourse in another level, to another level of what does it mean? He says that I am the bread of life. And, and what does it mean to say, I am the bread of life? Uh, and, and how does that connect to heaven? And so you're like, okay, what's next? And mm-hmm. and it's also um, the first I am with a predicate nominative in the Gospel of John. So that's also important. So that's a whole other thing. So that's why I say, wait, 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 wait till next week. And then, then you can do the first predicate nominative uh, in the uh, I am in the Gospel of John, which could be a riveting opening title. line for a sermon. <laughs> oh man, you really went for broke. Make that the title you put on the marquee. Oh yes, all the Mind. English teachers are coming to your service that Sunday. <laughs> I know they'll be thrilled. Mind blown. Mind I know. Blown. They're gonna. So, they will. Your congregation will follow you home, and they will say, "Give us another predicate nominative." <laughs> I'm telling you, the grammarians and the English teachers are just going to be beside themselves. They will. All right. So Exodus, I mean, and and this is I, this is also why I would just you know focusing on that on that particular section and not moving to I am the bread of life yet. How much you can bring in the Exodus passage, right? Um, and we talked about this about that this is the connection that Jesus is making that, you know, God provided uh, in the wilderness. Uh, it, God is doing that again through me. And, uh, and, but the connection that, that we need to make, of course, is that, uh, that, that 
not only is God through p- providing through Jesus, but God is present in Jesus. And so that's the, you know, that's the ultimate connection. But the way in which you can, the way in which you can bring in um, the Exodus text with, you know, with this section of John, four, uh, John 6 is really important. Mm-hmm. And that presence of God is a reminder to us that this is what God has always been doing. This is not a 2,000-year-old idea that was born with Jesus. This is what God has always been doing. And as the Gospel of John makes most clear, this is the ultimate offering, that to Mm -hmm. know Jesus is to know God. And that's the recovery of our right relationship with God that is expressed in a right relationship with one another. Yeah, and I think that's important because also, of course, this is pointing to a, a, a fundamental character of characteristic of God, yes. which is God is God is provider, provision, and uh, and sustenance and nurturing, and 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 then and then I would bring the psalm in in the same way. I mean, you've got the here, you've got He sent them food in abundance, um, mortal, and so you get all of you get language then here to. Uh, vocabularize, is that a word? I'm not sure. Vocabularize your sermon from the psalm. I like that word. Yeah. So So often we think of the gospel as being about, you know, salvation and what that, what that means for us individually. But um, this takes us all the way back to what was the problem in the prologue of the story, what happens when Adam and Eve doubt that God is the provider? And that's the fall. And the whole rest of the story is a demonstration that God's characteristic is trustworthy. God will provide. There was no need to doubt. All right. Want to go to Second Samuel? We feel like we can do that. You got Matt. Yeah, I I got nothing to add on the on Exodus. You all you said it all great, and the Psalm, God's always been providing, and it's mm-hmm. regular, right? The problem there was not just a one day of hunger. It's yeah, what happens when what happens when hunger is the persistent mm-hmm. experience right. of people, right? Yes. Which you and God about. rains it down, rains down crows and manna. <laughs> I don't know about the crows regularly. I don't know if I want the crows, but. Anyway. But you know, we don't, don't know. know what manna was either. I'm not sure there's much else on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hungry. You'd be the picky eater kid who's like, seriously, this again? <laughs> yeah. All yeah. right. Second Samuel, you were mentioning this last week, uh, Joy, with you know how the how uh, if you're going to preach. If you're going to preach um, on David and Bathsheba last week, then you need to continue to preach it this week. And do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, in the in the sense uh, that um, there there's a need, I think, for us to remember the transforming work of God. That um, in, in all that we're talking about here, when we were talking about the penultimate to the ultimate, it's, it's that God is doing something. Don't get caught at the short, you know, at the, the first thing. See the fullness of what God is doing. And, and when we see the rest of, so why is David, who, if we've preached the previous t- uh, text correctly, clearly fa- flawed, clearly flawed? Why is he lifted up? And it's because of how he responded. And how he responds to Nathan at this point is critical because um, for those of us who want to speak truth to power, sometimes what we have to do is we have to translate that message into a language that the power can hear. So we have to get out of telling the story that says, I judge you, and to say, these are your values. So here's a situation. How are you going to respond to that? And that's what Nathan does. And David, in all of his critical uh, response, he's like, this is wrong. Who is this person? We need to do something about this. And Nathan calmly says, glad you judged it that way, dude. I'm talking about you. And so it was 
David, uh, yeah, it was David's own self-revelation. But because of what we also learn about David, a man after God's own heart, that the transformation is possible, even in a flawed person. So don't give up on anyone if they are truly seeking God. Um, And God might send you to be their Nathan and learn their language if you're going to talk to them. And you need need this week to um, get that done. Well, I imagine most preachers see themselves as more like Nathan than anybody else in the story at at this stage. And that's that's, uh, important, I think, to dwell there a little bit. I like what you said, Joy, about how, what do you say exactly? If you're going to speak truth to power. Speak it in their language. Speak it in their language. I would say, too, you also have to be willing to what happens if power then says, yeah, you're right, or yeah, help me. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, which is, uh, which is harder. Yes. <laughs> which, which is really harder when it works. Cause then you have to figure out like, okay, so what would restoration look like for somebody in this circumstance? What would, what would forgiveness look like? You know, and it's not, everything goes back to normal. And, um, uh, and, and even what <laughs> the message Nathan gives to David is, I think, also kind of not kind of. I think it is gross as well. And in, in verses eleven through twelve, and it is. He, he, pastor will pro- a preacher will have, probably have to talk about that as well, right? That like, um, right? Who pays the price and why? And what does David's humiliation look like? And David's mm-hmm. humiliation looks like the humiliation of other people and mm-hmm. other women, and you know, mm-hmm. it's awful in every way. And they'll get even worse too even when worse. Absalom rebels and all that. So. Um, but, uh, you're right. There is this reminder that the church is going to seek to have a prophetic voice. Church also has to be a place that helps people figure out how to land and how to, it's the word I want, atone, how to start, start anew, whatever that looks like. And that looks different depending upon the sin and the person and the community. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. We, I think everybody knows that. Anyway, that's just Thank something you. I thought of from what you were talking about that I thought was really useful. Well, and I, I, I don't want to say this to uh, to deflect the issues or the, the the concerns and the challenge of a text like this, but I did I did appreciate the commentary, um, particularly around how we look at our own spaces of privilege and power, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yes. the and the fact part of the reason that. David was able to get away with all of this is uh, he was surrounded by people who did everything asked without question. Um, And the way in which we, the way in which we not only not critique the person in power, but the way in which the persons around them make that power, make that power happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or that, or how is it that a that a leader is so deeply unreflective <laughs> that uh, or purposely unreflective or no, or purposely just doesn't even sur- surrounds them pe- themselves mm-hmm. with people who uh, will support them at, at no matter what and uh, and so it I mean it it what it does is points to. Mm, the levels of uh, of institutional power, right, that allow for unchecked power to keep on uh, to keep on hurting and to keep on doing ha- doing uh, doing wrongdoing, and uh, and and it it points to the fact of how we as a church, we as individuals, we as uh, you know, parts of our culture are complicit in that, and uh, so I think that's another. It's a complicated direction, um, but I think important. It, it could be an important uh, point of of reflection on that particular sin. <laughs> and I, of, I would say would be. Um, you said could be, and I say would be if you keep in mind what Matt said. Um, when Matt said, you know, the ramifications, the consequences of that are ongoing. It's not just you know, the immediate consequences. But I mean, yeah. we see this in the family of, of David years later. Um, we see this, um, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, um, we see this in Israel. Um, we, we, uh, 
uh, I don't know, about a month ago, we were talking about David and uh, that this whole idea of what you're seeing, Caroline, of how the community uh, becomes complicit in this. Um, the ramifications might not happen immediately, but the next generation is going to have, you know, it, it's going to affect them. And so are we just concerned about ourselves or are we really concerned about our society, our community, which means the generation after us? All right. Ephesians. We've moved to a different section of Ephesians now, which is a shift to a more instructional kind of I think you can still make it doxological. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to ask I said. that. But I, I think, too, in terms of how, you know, this, this will be very brief, that how is it that the, that the language here that is more instructional becomes not, uh, it, 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 it liturgically could become more of like a charge, right? Mm -hmm. Or what is it that you're going, not just a dismissal, but an actual charge? What are you going to do with, with uh, what you have heard this week? Yeah. So to look, to kind of shift it a little bit um, and the ways in which, uh, the, the ways in which this language can have a, a, maybe just a different capacity in that liturgical setting, but nonetheless, um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and some folks might be familiar with verses one through six in particular. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In my congregation, we draw on this for baptism. We draw on it when we um, ordain elders and mm -hmm. install other leaders in the congregation. So, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some people will have heard it and to think about how it works as a charge mm -hmm. for the right. for all the saints is important. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also um, a, a link. Uh, to what we were talking about as we were talking about uh, uh, Samuel, uh, and that is um, um, that we no longer be tossed to and fro by people's trickery, craftiness, and deceitful scheming. Um, that line in itself um, might be um, liturgically repeated uh, if you're working the difficult passage of David that we were just talking about. And the other thing that comes to mind is um, people might be familiar with verse 11, where we talk about the gifts, um, and the commentary, commentary uh, addresses this a bit. But I want to point to verse 12. And what are those gifts given for? Um, not just a recognition of this leadership role or that leadership role or that particular leadership role, but for all the people of, of the community of God, for what purpose? And that is to, to equip the community for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.